So let's have a look at another example and this time introduce interest in the land as well. So we have Sarah who owns a large house with extensive grounds called Country House and Sarah is the owner of the freehold estate which continues on forever. And as a landowner she can grant rights over her land to other non-owners. So the first thing she does is that she grants a lease of an office to Lee for 15 years. Then she grants a right of way to Mrs East of a neighbouring property, the right to walk across Country House for Mrs East to reach her allotment. And this type of interest is known as an easement. She also agrees that Farmer Giles of a nearby farm can graze his sheep on the meadow at the edge of Country House and this is called a profit a pronda or simply a profit and then finally she's granted a mortgage to the Midshires Bank which we call a charge. So we have Lee's lease which is an estate and we have the right of way an easement the right to graze sheep on the land, a profit and a mortgage, which is a charge. So they are known as interests in the land because we wouldn't think of Mrs East and Farmer Giles and the bank as being owners of the land. Now let's come to the crux of the matter. If you want to know what land law is all about, it's about how these rights can affect a purchaser or new owners of the land. And we call these rights, which can affect purchasers, proprietary rights. So the rights that Lee, Mrs East, Farmer Giles and the bank have are capable of binding not just Sarah, but also third parties who were not part of the original agreement but who become the new owners of the land. And the rights are referred to as proprietary rights because they are capable of affecting third parties, principally a purchaser of the land. So the central issue is whether a third party purchaser who buys the land from the person who has created the rights is also bound by those rights. Just a quick one to throw in here. When you're reading about land law, you'll see that when lawyers refer to ownership, they talk about having title to the land. So here's a summary of what we've covered so far with regard to ownership and other rights in the land. So in terms of ownership, we've seen that the law recognises ownership through the concept of an estate, which is a period of time, and that as an owner, you have what we call enjoyment of the land. So you have the right to occupy the land and you have the right to receive an income from it. We've also seen that ownership can be split. So we saw that Woody granted a new estate out of his freehold by granting a leasehold estate to us. In that case, there were two concurrent owners, so they owned at the same time. And we've also briefly looked at the concept of successive estates, where owners' enjoyment of the land can be postponed until some point in the future. In relation to other rights in the land, which are not the same as full ownership, we've seen that they are referred to as interests and they are rights given to a third party, so they're not owners of the land. So you might give, for example, a right of way to your neighbour. And what we've seen is that these are proprietary rights. So they are capable of binding a purchaser or affecting a purchaser of the land 
And the other thing to note is that the list of possible interests is finite. So the type of rights that landowners can create over their land is limited to the type of rights recognised by the law. And you will study the most common ones. And this is simply to prevent the purchase of land from becoming too complex, as otherwise purchasers would have no clear idea of what potential rights they should be looking for. However, as you'll see, the fact that the type of interest is finite doesn't mean that the law isn't flexible. So, although completely new types of interest aren't recognised by the law, certain existing rights are developed over time. To give you a modern example, as you've seen, easements give a third party non owner a right to use the land in some particular way, such as a right of way. In recent years, the courts have recognised that the right to park vehicles on somebody's land can also amount to an easement. And then finally, remember that these rights are proprietary rights, which means that they're capable of continuing after a change of title or after a change of ownership. Most land law courses consider two main issues. First of all, how are these rights in land created? And then secondly, what happens when title or ownership to the land changes? So let's briefly look at how proprietary rights are created. And usually they are created expressly, and that means that they're created deliberately. Usually, in order to do this, you need a document which is known as a deed. And a deed is simply a document which must comply with certain formalities or certain requirements. So just as you may have seen that there are certain requirements for a valid contract, there are also certain requirements in order to create a deed. It must be signed and the signature must be witnessed, for example. Now, most property rights are created in this way by a deed, but you'll see that some property rights can arise by implication. In other words, their creation is implied from the circumstances. So if we just look at some examples, the usual method of granting a right of way, which is an easement, is by deed. So the landowner will execute a deed creating a right of way over their land. But the law also recognises that there are situations where an easement can arise without the need for a deed. And one method is by long use. So as you will discover when you study easements in more detail, if somebody has been using the land for at least 20 years, then they can acquire an easement because of that long use. And I can give you a real life example of this. My father owned a very nice little cottage in the village, which he'd owned for many years. And when he came to sell it, it was discovered that he didn't have an express right of way to his garage. And essentially, he would drive his car up a small track at the side of his neighbour's house to get to a group of three or four garages, one of which was his, at the rear of the house. All the owners of the garages had been doing this for many, many years. They all used it and everybody knew about it. So my father had acquired an easement, a right of way over this track because it had been going on for more than 20 years. So as long as certain requirements are satisfied, for example, that the right isn't exercised by force or secretly, then a right of way had been acquired. Now, here's another example. Sarah grants a lease for 15 years. She can do that expressly by executing a deed. But a lease can arise by implication. So if, for example, Lee is allowed to move into the converted cow shed and starts using it as an office, so he starts occupying the land and he pays Sarah, 
a rent for doing that, then the law will recognise that a lease has arisen because of the circumstances. Why else would a landowner allow somebody to occupy their property and pay them money for it if it wasn't intended that the third party was to acquire a lease? So just to remind you, what we've just seen is that most proprietary rights are created deliberately and that usually requires a deed. But there are situations where they can arise by implication. So because of the circumstances, the law recognises that a third party has acquired a proprietary right in the land. So just to remind you, most law courses consider two main issues. First of all, how proprietary rights are created, which is what we've just looked at. And then secondly, what happens when title to the land changes. So if we go back to Sarah and her country house, remember that Lee, Mrs East, Farmer Giles and the bank all have rights in the land which are binding on Sarah. But what we're interested in is whether they are capable of affecting third parties. So principally a purchaser of country house, are they also affected by those rights? And we refer to that as whether those rights are binding on a purchaser. So the central issue is whether a third party purchaser who buys land from the person who created the right is also bound by those rights and future owners of the land as well. So here's an illustration of the key question. Sarah, if you remember, has granted an easement to Mrs East, a right of way over her land. And then Sarah sells Country House to Polly. So the issue that we need to resolve is whether Polly is bound by Mrs East's right of way over Country House. Or can she simply say, well, I didn't agree to this shortcut. And so I'm going to stop you from using it. And we want to know whether Polly is bound by that right of way. That issue is not an easy question to answer because the answer is it depends. Property rights are not automatically binding on a purchaser. You may spend several weeks just studying this one issue about whether proprietary rights are binding on new owners of the land. Whether it's binding or not will depend on essentially two things. And whether a right is binding or not will depend on whether it's classified as either legal or whether it is equitable. And the other thing that it will depend on is whether title to the land is either what we call unregistered or registered. So essentially there are two different systems in which ownership of land is recognised. So depending on which system you're dealing with, that will then determine the relevant law that you need to look at to see whether particular rights are binding or not. OK, that's enough for today. It will get better, I promise. You just have to work at it, particularly in the first few weeks. So studying land law is like doing a jigsaw. You need to get the basic corners of understanding and then fill it in as you go along. It's important that you understand the general concepts that you'll be introduced to in the first few weeks of your learning. So the early teaching sessions are really, really important. So don't be tempted to skip them. Don't think that they're unimportant because they're just introductory in some way, the early sessions are really important and you'll come back to the concepts that you learn in those early sessions time and time again. The other thing is don't panic. As an experienced law tutor, I know that all students find land law confusing at first. So if you are completely bewildered, don't worry. Other students are very likely to be feeling the same thing too. And actually what you'll come to realise 
land law is very logical. It's all about different systems. And once you crack those systems, then essentially you've cracked land law. Now, it may be that the penny doesn't drop for the first term. And some students have told me that the penny didn't drop for them until right until the end of the course. So don't worry if you are finding it difficult. Just keep going and it will eventually become clearer. The next three videos that I recommend that you watch are the series relating to whether a property right is either legal or equitable. I will explain the relevant law to you and I will also take you through some worked examples using a technique known as the IRAC method. It's an excellent way to answer a problem question on any topic of law. So the sooner you start to use it, the better. So thank you so much for watching and I hope that you found it helpful. I'd be really grateful if you would consider subscribing to my channel or like and share this video because it really does make a difference. Just like you, I'm learning something new, which is how to make videos for YouTube. And hopefully, just like you, they will get better with practice. So give me some encouragement by subscribing to my channel and like and share my videos. I'm Amanda and I'm a former lecturer who now works as a private land law and trust tutor. If you are interested in private tuition, I've popped my email address on there so that you can contact me. Once again, thank you so much for watching and good luck with your studies.